Um, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And as many of you know, uh, you know Mary Ann, Dr. Mary Ann Perosi. She's the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Florida. Um, she is the science and the brains behind, uh, behind Audubon's uh, JWASH program. She's the person who sits in that room and reads those data sheets. So um, she makes sense of all our scribble. Uh, Mary Ann has been the core of JWASH for almost 10 years now. I couldn't figure out exactly when, but it's been a long time. And we always look forward to hearing from her to give us an overview of how the birds are doing and to thank you folks for all the, the effort that you've put into, into the field. So uh, Mary Ann, it's all yours. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, to Jaywatch 2020, a lot of people are saying bad things about 2020, but you know, many things did go well. Um, and I'm really happy to see all of you uh, who are on this um, uh, Zoom webinar today. We are recording this, so uh, we will adjust the beginning and the end and, and then send you all the link and it will be on our website uh, following this presentation. So or this morning's set of presentations. So, um, so first of all, is that an adult or a juvenile scrub jay? Put your answer into the chat. Very good. Old stars, everybody. Pretty obviously a juvenile. Uh, pretty good, pretty good photo one. Pretty skinny little little guy or girl. But nevertheless, okay. Thank you all. Um, okay, next slide. So um, I have up here uh, a little table that shows a number of volunteers that JWatch has trained since 2012. And this is when Audubon stepped into the, the uh, coordination role for JWatch. Uh, prior to 2012, uh, from 2002 to 2010, the Nature Conservancy uh, developed and managed uh, the program, uh, Cheryl Millett handed it off to the Fish and Wildlife Commission for one year in 2011, that was a transition. And then Audubon began managing the program in 2012. So I, that's when I started with JWatch. And you can see the number of people trained varies um, from year to year, but remarkably uh, in 2020 with webinars, we were able to train about as many people as we have on average in past years. And that doesn't count the number of people who viewed the training webinars after they were initially aired. We can't really discriminate, we can't get the names. So we don't know how many unique viewers there were afterwards, but still that's pretty good. Next slide. And the really, really great news um, is that even with COVID-19, uh, restrictions on travel and social distancing. There were 57 seasoned JWatch volunteers who contributed 510 hours to survey sites across the state. And that's really, that's really remarkable. I want to thank you all uh, who came out and did that because, you know, you kind of put your, you know, social distancing health on the line. Um, I think the site managers made it work and work well uh, outdoors. You know, it was a better, uh, better fit for social distancing. And I think people uh, rode in vehicles separately or walked from station to station. So I just wanna thank you all for ensuring that uh, there were 35 sites um, that were uh, counted. So usually we have 45 or so sites, 45, 46 sites. Uh, surveyed in a year. So 35 of 45, that's really pretty good. So again, I want to thank you all um, for coming out and for your dedication uh, for to JWatch. Next slide. 
So as I said, uh, so Jackie and I really did miss you all, uh, seeing you all at the trainings. Um, that's my little teary, uh, the little teary uh, scrub jay that says we missed you. Uh, we did put on three webinars, Ecology of Florida Scrub Jay and then a basic Jay Watch uh, survey protocol and an advanced training. On the bottom right of this slide, you can see where you can go uh, to just go to Florida Audubon's website, Audubon Florida's website, fl.audubon.org, and click on About Us, the About Us tab at the top, and you'll see a drop down for educational webinars. On there, you'll see a Scrub J panel. We've also done uh, webinars for other topics too this year, um, everything from Lake Okeechobee to Corkscrew Swamp, so a lot of, lot of good things on there. And you can view these, uh, they will stay on the website um, uh, forever, probably. <laughs> okay, next slide. So the bad news, I put the bad news up first. Uh, we have five sites that continue to have zero scrub jays. Um, although Lake Kissimmee State Park, which uh, dropped to zero, uh, there was one, I was notified, Fred, uh, Fred Allen let me know that there was one bird seen in the Buster Island area um, late, I think late in the summer, early fall. So it's possible that jays will recolonize that site. I uh, certainly hope so. Um, the rest of them so far have reported uh, zero scrub jays this year. So, you know, we can be hopeful. Uh, Shelly Rosenberg, one was seen at Jupiter Ridge in March. Credible sighting, but no photos. Okay, so Jupiter Ridge Natural Area is the last site that we know of that had scrub jays in Palm Beach County. Um, and I know Archbold is uh, doing some work out there. So hopefully there will be a recolonization there. Um, There's so many birds being produced at nearby uh, Jonathan Dickinson State Park that there is a source of birds. So we'll see. Next slide. So I wanna take you all on a, a bit of a tour. Um, Lyonia Preserve, for those of you who usually survey uh, these sites, what I have on these sites is uh, the last 10 years worth of data or actually 11 years worth of data um, some of these sites have a history before then, but it, at some point it gets difficult to read the numbers if I try and get all the data on there. You get a lot, so many uh, numbers on there that you wouldn't be able to really take a look. So last 11 years worth of data. So the number of groups and birds is declining at Lyonia Preserve. Um, that was expected because as the area around this very, very urbanized uh, preserve has developed um, and the scrub jay habitat has removed, the scrub jays uh, flew over to Lyonia Preserve. So basically for a number of years, the habitat was oversaturated with jays. There are too many jays and the habitat really couldn't support that. So uh, the experts have long expected for the number to decline back to what that site can actually support in terms of food resources and, and water and territory size. So it's not quote unquote really bad news. It doesn't mean that you know, scrub jays are gonna you know, wink out at this site and disappear. It just means that um, there's, there's a better balance that's being developed at this site over time. Okay, next slide. So Pot Preserve is a site some of you all may not uh, be aware of. This is in Eastern Citrus County. Um, it's always surveyed by uh, Brenda Kern, usually leads um, the surveys there uh, in conjunction with Swift Mud. South, Southwest Florida Water Management District. And there are two, uh, there are two groups there, uh, way out in a fairly remote area on this site. Uh, this site is gated um, and uh, it has hunting at certain times of the year, but there's still a few uh, scrub jays hanging on out there. So this is the only jay watch site in Citrus County. So I decided to give it a little, you know, heads up this year. 
Next slide. Lake Monroe Conservation Area is in Volusia County. Um, this is a site owned by St. John's River Water Management District. Um, the number the this site has been augmented with scrub jays. Some scrub jays were translocated there, so uh, it's had more birds in the past. The number of birds is um, has declined, but again, maybe to a stable level. This is fairly unusual habitat. It's kind of wet in a lot of areas. So it's not the, the typical dry upland uh, area, but still supporting birds and it has a great volunteer involvement program. So um, I, I always encourage people to get out and survey different sites to see the different habitats that scrub jays live in. It's really interesting and educational and you get to meet new people. So uh, next slide. This is the other site that St. John's River Water Management District has uh, welcomes JWatch uh, volunteers to help survey. And this is actually a survey from a past year because they only had staff do the surveys here uh, and at Lake Monroe. This one is actually in, in Northern Brevard County. Um, this site is really, has also received translocated jays. Uh, there's something about this site that is uh, apparently unsuitable for the jays and the numbers have been dropping. So this is a, a real disappointment uh, to the water management district staff and to all the volunteers that work here. Um, so not doing really well, not really sure what the future is gonna be at Buck Lake. Next slide. Um, this is a site that's very popular with a whole group of volunteers um, from uh, Marion County and Citrus County Audubon chapters in particular. This is owned by Southwest Florida Water Management District and it is in Western, far Western Marion County. Um, this site just, we just began surveying this in 2012 actually. Uh, so this is the extent of the history there. Um, I have in the right column for 2020, a lot of pluses, and that's because uh, there were two surveys done rather than three, that was all we could manage. Uh, thank you to the volunteers that went out there in the photo there is uh, Brenda Kern and Virginia Hall and Mickey Mouse sitting on the uh, roof of the car there. That's because Jaywatch is sponsored by Disney conservation fund in large part. Um, on the left is Simon Fitzwilliam, who is the new uh, volunteer coordinator for uh, Northeast Florida, I believe from FWC and Cindy Gates from Swift Mud on the far right there. So they were doing, uh, oh, Josie, is that Josie? Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. She's taller than you, Brenda, but of course, everybody's taller than you, right? So <laughs> I'm kidding. So Josie, sorry, Josie Muncie and not Virginia. Very good. Thank you for surveying this site. The site, the, the results were a bit hard to determine. There were some J's heard in certain areas rather than seen. So that's why I've got pluses there. There are more J's there than uh, were really nailed down by the surveys this year. Next slide. Blue Spring State Park uh, has been doing really well. You can see um, the number of adults. I'm, I've got to take a look there at the number uh, and reanalyze last year's uh, data because it looks a little odd, but um, the number of juveniles is accurate. They've been doing, um, Jason Depew, the district biologist, uh, has been working with staff to do a lot of burns at this site. Um, and they're improving the habitats. We expect to see the numbers rebound at Blue Spring. This is in Western Volusia County. Um, so uh, near Orange City, I think. And there's Mickey again, sitting with a, Mickey with a mask. Next slide. So, um, Jackie put in a plug for our Facebook page, and I wanted to put in another plug here. Um, 
I realize that uh, this year has been difficult on Facebook for a lot of people. Uh, with the election year, there's been a lot of uh, vitriol and what have you. So a lot of people are staying off Facebook. But you know, if you only go on Facebook, go to our group page because there are new photographers joining our group all the time. This is Shelley Rosenberg, who has contributed a number of really beautiful photos. Um, there's so many of you that contribute photos. Um, Susan Kirby and Pam Moran and Paul Strauss. And I, I can't even name, I'm, I'm apologize because I know I'm forgetting people. Um, really, really great photos that are shared and please do share people photos too from when you are uh, out there. Uh, Marianne Brown has been sharing some photos too. So I welcome, we really welcome all these great photos. Um, they can really put a smile on your face in, in you know, in times like now when there's so much stress everywhere. Next slide. Moving on to the Southeast, Savannah's Preserve State Park, which is in Martin County. Uh, looking pretty good, holding steady uh, with birds. A number of groups, a number of adults and juveniles. Uh, they had an off year last year, but had five juveniles this year. And we did not do an uh, on-site training this year. So this was last year's uh, training group there. Doing really well. Uh, there's some terrific volunteers, long-term volunteers. Dee Staley uh, has been serving there for many, many years and, and helped with the job. Out. Next slide. And at Jonathan Dickinson wow. State Park. So I wanted you all to take a look at this. Um, Jonathan Dickinson State Park has begun receiving some translocated jays from Ocala National Forest uh, to uh, two translocations, uh, two groups of birds have been translocated there. Um, but notwithstanding the translocations, they've been doing a tremendous job of habitat restoration there burning overgrown areas. And you can really see the number of juveniles are, are surviving there. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing that population growth each year. You're seeing higher juvenile survivorship each year because there's room, there's space, there's good quality habitat for those juvenile birds to colonize or to mate with older birds, more mature birds uh, and set up new territories. So if you don't create new habitat, you know, by restoring overgrown habitat, you don't have any room for the population to grow. So this is a, this is a great success story. And I know Rob Rossmaneth, the biologist there is just beaming ear to ear. He's so happy um, to see these birds as are all of you who help survey at Jonathan Dickinson State Park each year. It's really, really good news. Jim Howe, has, uh, he's been doing walks out there for years. Um, and I know many of you, Shelly, you survey there, lots of you. Uh, really thank you for continuing this effort. Next slide. We have one private tract and I see I missed uh, on this slide. Uh, <laughs> forgot to put the number of adults in there. Uh, Fred and Ann Hunter, I do not know if they're on today, uh, and their daughter, uh, Martha Formella, have uh, sponsored uh, and supported JWatch surveys every year um, since at least 2010, I think before then. Fred uh, and, and Ann and Martha work very hard uh, to, uh, Fred's been doing a lot of uh, habitat restoration out there, uh, logging, um, overgrown areas, and the numbers are holding steady. And actually one pair has moved over from Seminole State Forest onto the Eastern border. Fred's property is now using that area, that new newly restored area. So we expect to see some additional colonization um, on this site uh, in the future. Next slide. This is another tremendous success story. And I wanna thank all the volunteers, especially who do this. Uh, these surveys here, this is a big property. It's a very big property. It takes a lot of volunteers. Um, and uh, I think Laurie Dolan is on the, uh, I, I saw her come in today. 
and uh, all the volunteers who uh, do this. There's Monica Folk on the right side who bans the birds at this um, site. Uh, Laurie has made big, big inroads in getting most all of the uh, adults banded as well as as many of the juvenile birds as possible uh, at the end of the summer, early fall. Um, it makes it a lot easier to determine how many, really exactly accurately, how many family groups um, are on this site. And you can see there the number of juveniles. I mean, it's just great. 48 uh, and 37 juveniles in the past two years and the number of birds just growing like crazy out there. Laurie's done a lot to restore new habitat, uh, restore overgrown habitat, to add areas where the birds can colonize. So again, this is increased survival of juvenile birds uh, that are then able to mate with older, more experienced birds and form new territories because they have the space to do that. Next slide. Uh, Catfish Creek State Park is a really wonderful uh, J-Watch site. If, if you all haven't been out there, it has got sugar sand galore and beautiful uh, hills, uh, ridges of hills that are separated by depression marshes. It's really a beautiful property. It's very unusual um, as scrub sites go and it has a lot of birds, a lot of birds out there. So um, the site is really holding its own over the years. Um, Eric Eggensteiner is doing a great job of, uh, you know, re restoring the property again. There were not uh, the same number of, of surveys that are usually done. There weren't as many pairs of eyes out there. Um, so, and I need to take a look at the number of groups out there for last year. It's, it's sometimes difficult to sort out uh, the number of groups, um, if they're, depending on how many people, how many pairs of eyes there are out there. But that site's still looking good. If you can get out there, I encourage you to do so. Next slide. Um, Indian River County scrub sites are surveyed annually by a core of people. Um, and again, again I, I hear myself saying thank you a lot today in this presentation. But especially in a year like this, um, there are a number of sites in Indian River County that are all fairly um, small sites. Uh, there aren't that many uh, J's, but thank you to the group of people that just continue to, to survey these sites every year. Next slide. It's not always fun to go out and survey sites that don't have a lot of scrub jays, you know, and, and it could be kind of depressing. And especially like, as you see on this slide, there are no juveniles um, on these four sites. So, and they're apparently extirpated from the Winter Beach uh, 65th Street site. But I, I just wanna commend you all um, for continuing to survey and track these sites. It's super important data. Uh, I put the burrowing owl slide up there just because I want to say that even if you don't get to see scrub jays at all the sites, sometimes there's a lot of really interesting other things to see at sites, and you never know what you're going to turn up. Could be a burrowing owl, could be, you know, a bear, could be almost anything. Okay, next slide. Uh, so leadership in, far in Southwest Florida, Manatee County uh, and Charlotte County, I wanna thank Kay Prophet in particular for leadership in surveying several sites um, in Manatee uh, County and for taking over, uh, coordinating the surveys at Prairie Shell Creek, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, these are sites that are owned and managed by Southwest Florida Water Management District. Um, Gilly Creek Reserve is one of them. Um, the site doesn't have a lot of jays. It's kind of an unusual site. The, the scrub is very patchy. Um, so it's an odd site. Uh, if when you go out there to survey it, um, again, it, you know, it's one of those sites, it's very, very remote. Um, the scrub jays are in very remote areas. Um, very hard to get to if you don't have gate access. 
So one of the things I do annually is apply for a permit from SWIFTMUD to get gate access for all of these sites. Um, so it's kind of a privilege really to um, be able to um, join these survey teams and get to see some of these remote sites which have really unusual um, uh, habitat for jays. But the jays are there. Next slide. So this is, uh, I decided to put the map up here. It's really uh, a combination of, in some places, there are creeks, you know, uh, riverine habitats, uh, where you, and during the breeding season, you might turn up uh, yellow-billed cuckoos. We had one of those one year. Um, we had a co huge coach, coach whip snake uh, cross in front of us on one of these creeks. So the habitat's really patchy. You can see here, there's a north central, uh, north area, a central patch, and a south area that uh, is right next to a scrub, uh, a pasture. It's actually a cattle pasture there on the very south boundary of the map that's showing there. It's really an un unusual habitat, but the jays hang out there, probably because it's remote, uh, very likely. Next slide. <laughs> this is another uh, site in uh, Eastern Manatee County, Moody Branch Mitigation Area. It is uh, owned by Manatee County, uh, managed by FWC. Um, this site is uh, normally surveyed. The lead uh, leadership for the site is uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Commission staff and volunteer coordinator this year. Um, uh, Kay Prophet also led a survey out here. So I actually had two survey sets, data sets this year. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a, a stable number of family groups out here for the last few years, five groups. The habitat is limited, so there really isn't more habitat to colonize in particular. Um, but the number of adults and the, the family groups are getting larger on average. So it's kind of a neat side again. Um, it is close to Duet Preserve and South Fort Preserve, which is also owned by SWIFTMUD. Excuse me. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> this is the only site in Charlotte County right now that JWatch surveys um, Prairie Shell Creek Reserve. Again, it's a SWIFTMUD property, has quite a few groups. So um, it requires two survey teams uh, working simultaneously to survey the east and west sides of the property. <coughs> Excuse me. And they had pretty good um, breeding productivity this year. Eight juveniles was really pretty good. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, uh, next slide. So, <clears throat> what will 2021 bring? We really don't know, actually. Um, <clears throat> I put this slide up here. Uh, this actually happened at a JWAT site in um, Highlands County um, I, that I was out there. This is my photo and a great horned owl literally flew in over our heads. The Jays, the Jay family group that was around this, these snags dove. <laughs> to the ground when the owl flew overhead, the owl perched back there and you never know what you're gonna see. You really don't. So it's the unusual. Um, we don't know if we're gonna have vaccines widely available. We don't know, um, you know if we're gonna be surveying, uh, if we're gonna be able to do on-site trainings. As, the, as time goes on, it looks less like we can do on-site trainings, but we'll see. You know, some of us are really anxious to get out there and do the surveys again. And I think um, site managers of Florida Parks um, really gotten better at figuring out how to do surveys safely with people. So I anticipate that you all will be able to um, get out on some of these sites. Uh, maybe it'll be in small groups. I certainly hope so. And, and I just wanna say thank you to all of you for, uh, for hanging in there. You know, the going has gotten rough this year, but hopefully uh, the program will continue and we'll be able to see all of you out there uh, in 2021. 
That is my last slide. Any questions? So thank you, Marianne. We're going to take about five minutes to, uh, to answer some questions and then take a, a tiny little break. Um, Erica is resetting uh, for our next presentation. Um, now, Monica did have some interesting comments she put in the chat. Monica, do you want to just, um, just mention what you were sharing? If you're uh, on mute. You got to sure. unmute yourself. Yeah, I did. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that on, in Indian River County, the county has an HCP. So they actually have a, a, a group of about five scrub preserves that were set aside specifically for jays. And they are doing a fabulous job of managing and in fact, growing their populations on those sites. So the four preserves that are the sites that uh, Marianne mentioned that the Jay Watch is monitoring are just the private sites. So I just didn't want everybody to think Indian River County now has almost no Jays uh, because on those public preserves, they are doing really, really well. Um, thanks to the management of Beth Powell. She is a really good website. Yes, you're right. I, I should have mentioned that. Um, yeah, Beth Powell's doing a great job. Wabasso Preserve and there are a number of preserves. I just, you know, I was just featuring the Jay Watch data from some small sites, but there are plenty of Jays in Indian River County. I think uh, part of Sebastian River uh, Preserve is in Indian River County too, and there are lots of Jays there as well. It is, that's true. The Jays at uh, St. Sebastian have actually been struggling for the last couple of years. The reproduction there has been very low. Uh, we don't know why. A lot of Indian River birds are actually moving to the preserve because uh, the Indian River preserves have become a source, whereas the, the oh. St. Sebastian is a sink. Uh, <clears throat> but that turned around this year. They actually had oh. fabulous reproduction on St. Sebastian River Preserve. So now both sites are doing really well. So I Great. think it'll equalize uh, and both will get to carrying capacity and then hopefully they can be the source for those four small private sites that Jay Watch does so well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so another question, how do you get to cat, cat Creek? Obviously, uh, Marianne, you did a great selling job there. <laughs> That's how it was. How do you get to Catfish Creek? Yeah, State Park. <clears throat> um, you just go to the website and yeah, I would go to the website, but it's Fire Tower Road. You want to go in on that access. Um, look for the, uh, there's a, an access, there's a parking area on Fire Tower Road in Polk County. Just if you Google map that, there's a little parking area and you can walk straight in and there's loads of J's on the west side there. <clears throat> Great. And um, Shelly Rosenberg says she's not giving up on uh, Palm Beach County. So there you go. I hope, well, yeah, let's not give up on any county, on any site. <laughs> okay, um, I guess that's pretty much it. Not a lot of questions. Uh, what I would say is let's take just five minutes. Um, people can get up and go and do whatever they need to do. And, and, um, <clears throat> Erica is setting up for our next presentation, and then we will come back and you can introduce our next speaker, Marianne. I so we'll be one more question pop in there. Deer Prairie Creek, yeah, there's one pair that doesn't seem to be successful uh, at reproducing. <clears throat> it's kind of in the south central area, well out into the preserve. Don't think there are any surveys that are being, no, there are no J watch surveys that are being done in the Claremont area. The surveys uh, on private property in the Northern part of the county, very, very Northern next to Seminole State Forest. Okay, so we'll see everybody at uh, 10.40. So welcome back everyone. Uh, <clears throat> our next speaker of the day, our star speaker is uh, Todd Mecklenburg and he is the, a biologist for the US Fish and Wildlife Service stationed in Florida. Much but not all he says of his work is uh, <clears throat> revolves around the recovery plan 
for the Florida scrub jay, but he is the authority in Florida for uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on Florida scrub jays. He is going to give you all uh, an overview of the revised federal recovery plan and the species status uh, for Florida scrub jays today. Take it away, Todd. Thank you, Marianne. Those are very kind words. Um, I am informed, I work with all the experts, but um, I'm pretty much a liaison between the experts to the service. Um, and Marion came up with the clever title, a bird's eye view for the revised recovery plan, which is very clever. So um, my presentation today is gonna to be very brief and very basic, and then I'll try to answer as many questions as I can in this forum afterwards. Next slide. So what we're gonna briefly talk about today is um, basically the second item there, the scrub jay recovery plan. The third is the scrub jay five-year review. And then I want to tell you about some things that uh, we're working on and the directions we're going for like, we're actually have a uh, population viability analysis model under development by Dr. Lacey and Dr. Brenninger. And we have ongoing research, which was touched upon earlier by uh, Carl Miller and Fitzpatrick and Reed Bowman and all those folks down at, uh, and several others down at Jonathan Dickinson. I just wanted to mention, if you get, go to our site, fws.gov, you'll see a Florida Status Species Assessment, which is a really inclusive document um, that summarizes pretty much everything since listing. We listed the species in 87, and our first recovery plan was 1990. Um, so now what I'm going to do is briefly talk about the, uh, the recovery plan that was signed in late 2019. Next slide, please. So um, as if you could, know, um, if you could speak maybe a little closer to the uh, microphone, uh, some folks said they're having a little trouble hearing. Okay, I've got my thing turned up. Is that better? If people turn up the volume all the way on their own laptops or own computers, it compensates for uh, talking a little bit faint. Just turn turn your own volume up, each each one of you, and you'll you should have no trouble. Okay, and I got I have my laptop right next to me. So just to give a little background. Um, the genetic units that uh, Coolen did in starting in 2008 through 2010, it kind of builds on what Brad Stiff did back in the mid 90s of meta populations. So there's basically uh, 10 genetic units and you can see they're all right there. Next slide. And then if you look real closely, you can see uh, Brad's meta populations. They're the number um, M, like M17, M2, M3. That would be like in the Ocala area. So the, the meta population data fit really well into the, the genetic unit. And Brad's, Dr. Stiff's uh, meta population, it was basically based on behavioral, it was dispersal distances. And the genetics was done um, out of uh, Cornell, and that's when they did blood samples. And so you can see how everything pretty much fits in really well. Next slide, please. So what we did, what we, have a, we had a recovery team reorganized in 2011, and pretty much all the experts in the scrub jay world were on the team. And what we did is about, we did a mapping exercise, and we based it on Reed Bowman and John Fitzpatrick's technical report back in 90. One, I believe it was. It was a technical 19, it was a commission FWC. Well, back then it was a Florida Fish and Game report, but it basically uh, had uh, simulations of extinction risks. And so what we did is we, that's all we had to go on. And so we based that on, he had, they had a, uh, a 40 territory threshold that they said, if you had 40 territories in an isolated area, that its persistence should be fairly good with like less than 5% extinction risk over a hundred year period. So we used the 40 territory metric and we tried to map areas throughout the state. 
So when we look at these next slides, you're going to see the blue outline. So if you look at the at the legend, you'll see it says focal landscape. A focal landscape is something that we coined. Um, we wanted to recover units, but that's a fish and wildlife term, and we were told we weren't allowed to use that term. Um, if you're familiar with red cockaded woodpeckers, they have recovery units. Um, for some reason, the service decided we couldn't use that term. So basically, we came up with our own term, which is it's an identical it's an identical term. It just it means the same. So what we did is we went around and we looked at all of the potential areas that had large carrying capacities that, that we felt could support over 40 territories. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have 40 territories existing there now, but they have the potential with the existing landscape or with potential acquisitions. So like the, the largest, I'm going from the largest focal landscapes down to the smallest. And what we did is we have, we came up with, we came up with a lot of focal landscapes and then we had to narrow it down to seven focal landscapes that occur in six of the 10 genetic units. So our largest focal landscape is centered around Ocala National Forest. And some of the, the major conservation lands are Ocala National Forest, Seminole State Forest, and Rock Springs Run, which is part of the state, the state park. Um, I want to really make it clear that just because you're not, you won't see things in a focal landscape, like for this one, for example, the cross Florida barge canal, the, Par the Marjorie Carve, that's not included in a focal landscape, even though they're, you know, the, the birds have been increasing there, there's potential viability there. Um, we, we, we did not include areas like that um, for various reasons, which we can get into side discussions. So these are areas that we will base species recovery on. So we, we want to, we have like very general metrics for these areas. And if we can hit the metrics in these seven focal landscapes and six of the genetic units, then we would consider reclassifying the bird. Next slide. The second largest population and the second largest focal landscape is centered around Maradona National Wildlife Refuge. Um, you can see during our, our mapping exercise, there's a lot of small areas that can support a handful of birds or up to a couple dozen birds. Um, but we, we centered our, our, we wanted to actually prioritize and try to concentrate our early efforts in these focal landscapes, figuring if we can build these populations resiliencies up um, and make them as robust as popular as possible, that hopefully they'll wave out, they'll butt out like, like scrub jays uh, do in, in a, on a landscape. And hopefully we can start seeding in, be a source and start seeding into some of these areas that are potentially sinks now or could become uh, auxiliary or supplemental um, support areas. So for the uh, Northeast Coastal Genetic Unit, it's Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Um, you know, it also includes like uh, the National Seashore and you know, a few other in holdings within there. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Lake Wales Ridge is no longer, we don't consider it one meta population. Sebring kind of splits it. So we have two genetic units. We have two focal landscapes, excuse me, in the genetic unit. The south one is the largest one. We centered that around Archibald Biological Station. So you can see everything in blue is a focal landscape, is a priority where we're trying to direct our efforts and do good things. You know, we do habitat restoration. We do additional acquisition. Um, we, we would do translocations, things like that. Not, you know, if you look at the south area, you know, Fish Eating Creek and Platte Branch and all that, there's still birds down there. It's just that we had to focus. We can't go everywhere. We are very limited on resources, money, staff. And so we had to focus on where we thought our best hope was. So if you, you can see that um, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of pop properties that you guys are probably familiar with that are, and, and a lot of them are doing well, like Lake Placid Scrub. That's as far as we can tell, that's over what we would expect as a carrying capacity for it. Um, but, you know, we have Archfall, which is the largest, that's about 5,000 acres, Highlands Hammock, Lake June and Winter, Flamingo Villas, the FWC property, there's a lot more. If you go to some of the links that, I, I'll, that are provided in the slideshow later on, um, you can find out more information and, 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 and then you can generate some more questions. You can always email them to me and I'll try to respond. Next slide. So the previous was the south area, that, which is basically south of Sebring. And then the north area is basically Avon Park and centered around Lake Wales Ridge State Forest, the Arbuckle Track. Um, those are really important areas, along with Catfish Creek, Carter Creek, um, Tiger Preserve. When you go really far up that ridge, there's a lot of scattered populations that are small and fragmented. And that's one reason we didn't include everything in a focal landscape. Because if we're if we look at everything throughout the range and everything's a focal landscape, we get back to what we were doing back in the 90s when um, Brad Stiff's metapopulation uh, simulation suggested that we, we go after the most vulnerable populations and we do the most things we could there. And we tried that early on. You know, we did a lot of work at Cedar Key. We did a lot of work down in Southwest Florida. And for all the effort we put in, we really didn't get a whole lot of return. So this new strategy in the, in the recovery team, in the recovery plan, excuse me, is to try to look at the, the largest and the areas that have the most potential to grow birds and to have viability. Next slide. Okay, now we're over in like say Brevard County and then River, which we had some talk about the East Coast genetic unit. Um, it basically centers around San Sebastian. It also, uh, North Sebastian conservation area, conservation area is very important as along with some of the eels projects, the eel properties, um, Valrica, Jordan, Malabar, Mako. Recently, there was a big, uh, something that we've been working on since the late nineties. There was a big land swap in Valcaria between the Florida Inland Navigation District and eels, the Brevard County Conservation Group. And what we did is we were able to move their, their future dredge disposal site out of the center of the Valcaria conservation area and put it on the side and, and say less and not as high quality um, scrub. And so we went to divide that population. So we're hoping with, uh, you know, working with Dr. Brenninger and the Eels folks and, and Brevard County to um, start trying to increase those areas. Um, as you can see, we identified three, what we call core areas. And what I alluded to earlier, a core areas is any area that can support 40 territories or more. So we're, we're, we want to try to build up those three cores and then along with the support areas and auxiliary areas um, and the, the other areas that we don't have a label for that could be stepping stones to get birds to dance around that landscape and disperse and, and get gene flow going. Next slide. So now we're over on the uh, west coast, uh, basically Manatee County, and our focal landscapes our focal landscape for that is centered around Duet and Mosaic Wellfield. Um, and Marion also showed some numbers for some of these properties like Gilly Creek and Moody Branch and areas like that. I, I think right now off the top of my head, there's probably about 50 territories in that complex. Um, there's a real big opportunity in the Southwest corner and it says, it says Core F2. Um, it's the Jurassic's. There's a couple big private landowners, and we'd like to start getting engaged with them to maybe get some of that area in conservation because that would be a, a second area that uh, could support a large number of birds. Um, what you can you can kind of see with this graphic is if you look at that legend, you can see what we did is we we did buffering and everything, so we had 
the, the red is potential one to nine territories, the orange is 10 to 39, and then the, the green is over 40 territories. What we did is we buffered these areas by what an average uh, dispersal distance is for scrub jays, which is about 670 meters, about two territories. And then we buffered it again by typical, we're about 90 or 95% of all scrub jays limit their dispersal too, which is about 2.2 miles, three and a half kilometers. So you can see that there still are some gaps, but in fragmented landscapes, birds tend to disperse farther than in connected landscapes. Um, so anyway, that, that's our approach for the Southwest Inland Genetic Unit. Next slide. And I believe this is our, I believe this is the seventh. This is the Jonathan Dickinson um, basically center. And as Marion mentioned earlier, Carl Miller from, uh, Dr. Miller from the commission can talk more about it, but they've been translocating Jays down there for a couple of years now and we plan to continue it. What we're looking at right now, uh, John Fitzpatrick's daughter is doing a study, Sarah Fitzpatrick, on um, potential genetic rescue or possibly population augmentation. So what we did is we got a baseline of all the birds in Jonathan Dickinson State Park prior to translocations. And what they, they're going to try to figure out over the next couple of years as the translocated birds integrate into the resident population, will that help us overcome uh, some of the recruitment issues and build the populations? They've done a great job at managing the habitat and there apparently is a lot of available habitat that's unoccupied. So that's what we're looking into, try to figure out is, is it a genetic bottleneck right now? Um, and by supplementing birds from another genetic unit, will that help us overcome that? Or do they just need population augmentation, which would help the demography? And the dem demography is like uh, a simple way to explain that is like how the birds are, are arranged on the landscape. So where are they? Can they find mates? Do they have the ability to go to other areas and find a mate? Is it, is it close enough? Is it too far? Things like that. So we're looking at the demography and the genetics for that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is just a this is a, a just a basic summary of what I just talked about. So, focal landscapes are priority areas with the highest potential for recovery of the species. Once again, it doesn't mean if you have a favorite place that you go birding and where you find your scrub jays, if it's not within that focal landscape, that it doesn't matter. They all populations are important. But for responsibilities we have to Congress, we have to come up with a plan or strategy to say, okay, this species has been listed. How can we improve the status of the species and, and how can we recover it so that it no longer needs protection afforded by the Endangered Species Act? So once again, there's seven focal landscapes and six of the genetic units. That's where our priority as the service will be where we'll try to do a lot of our actions, where we'll try to do acquisition, we'll try to do habitat management, we'll be doing research. Um, those are our priority areas early on to try to stabilize or improve those, pro those populations and, and attain viability. Um, I clipped some of the criteria in the recovery plan. There's a couple things that were put in there that really don't make a whole lot of sense but they were, I was trumped on that and they put them in anyway, but basically um, we have to have stable or increasing population trends in these focal landscapes we identified. We have to have connectivity amongst the subpopulations within these areas and we have to reduce the threats, which you know is continual, which is habitat loss and degradation. Um, there's other things in there too, some disease stuff and it goes back to the five factor analysis we do um, for listing. But basically, that is a summary of what I talked about. And, and somewhere in this presentation, there'll be links for all these um, 
uh, documents where you can go to and find them online. Uh, I, I think I was told we're going to go through the whole presentation, then we'll go back for questions. It'll be easier just logistically that way. Uh, next slide, please. So now what here they are. Okay, so so what we also did a five year review. We have to do a five year review. We're supposed to do it every five years. The, actually, the prior five year review was done in 2007. So that was more than five years, but um, there were reasons that that happened. And um, so basically the recent five year review we did, um, basically it's, we said this, the species declining based on the most recent range wide survey, which Raul and Reed did back in 2011. Uh, one of the things we've identified in this document, it's, on, it's in the very back of the document under future actions, is to do a statewide survey. We really need a statewide survey. Um, that first link I gave you that came in, came up in blue for some reason, that's a species profile in our ECOS module. And that will, that basically has links to all the documents that are associated with Florida scrub jays. The second link is the actual five-year review. So you can find it in the first link, but I, I highlighted it in the second link. Uh, next slide. So in the five-year review, uh, Marion kind of went through a lot of these and our numbers are real similar. Um, they might be off of a territory or two, but um, in the five-year review, these are, these are conservation properties that are, that are in a focal landscape identified in each of the genetic units. These, the, the arrangement in the five-year review was not based on largest to smallest, it went from A to I. And so as you can see, Marion showed some of these numbers. Here are some of the trends of the, of the important properties in the, in the focal landscape. Next slide. Uh, this basically incorporates both our focal landscapes. Um, you might notice that Archibald is down a little bit. That's not a big deal. It's it's kind of, it's basically within their fluctuation of you know we there were a couple bad years and we kind of have some ideas of why, but um, that that's not really a big deal. Avon Park bombing range, on the other hand, is we've got a we've got a couple uh, service biologists out there working with the um, Air Force and um, Archibald. But historically, back in 2000, back in 1992, there were about 100 territories at Avon Park. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's showing a declining trend, um, which that's a very large landscape. So we really need to get a grip on that. We've got a, a really sharp biologist uh, out there, Rob Eldridge. He did his master's with Archibald, and then he did a PhD on birds up at Clemson. Um, so they're they're really working hard and they're and they're they're burning, they're managing, they're doing all kinds of studies. So hopefully we'll start turning that around. Catfish Creek, um, as Marion mentioned, that that's been going in a very positive direction. We're actually looking at try to trying to acquire some additional property just north of the park, um, which would help improve, which would add to carrying capacities. Um, our buckle track is doing well, as you can see. Um, if you jump down to the uh, Lake Wells Ridge WEAs, the um, wildlife environmental and areas, uh, Lake Placid Scrub is doing very well. We, we actually calculated the carrying capacity for that, which was much less than those numbers you're seeing there, but it, it's saturated. It's a great source where it's pushing birds out to the adjacent properties. Uh, next slide. Merritt Island. Maryland Island's another um, cause for concern. It used to be quite a bit higher than that. Um, we, it seems to be stabilizing now. It used to be up in the 300s. I think it was as high as 380 at one point, number of territories. Cape Canaveral is starting to show a decline, which we have been anticipating for a while because when we look at the recruitment, we look at the juvenile production, it hasn't been what's needed to sustain that population. Um, 
anyway, so I mean, the, so it, even some of these large landscapes are having issues. Next slide, please. Seminole State Forest, here's our largest uh, population. Um, Seminole State Forest has actually gone down a little bit, but it, it's, it's pretty much stable. We had an influx of birds that kind of popped it up for a while there. Um, right now with the amount of uh, suitable habitat, those are pretty good numbers. Ralph Rich is doing a great job out there. Carl Miller's working with them quite a bit. Um, so we're, we're really trying to work on that. Ocala National Forest, it's such a large landscape. We really don't have a true estimate. Um, I, I put the footnotes in and you can read more about it, but we, we, we estimate that there's, there's roughly about a thousand territories. Um, I just was working with the Navy on Pine Castle Bombing Range, which is right in the middle of Ocala National Forest. And um, that area is doing very well. They, they have a lot of, it's like Avon Park, you know, they, their bombing um, ignites fire. So they have a lot of fires, but we actually think that they have higher densities of territories in that area than the rest of the forest. Um, another note for Ocala National Forest is they did a forest plan amendment, which you can read all about in the status species assessment. And it's touched on briefly in the five-year review. Um, but they basically, in the, in the past, we were counting on timber management and they'd harvest their sand pine and we'd have a window of about say year three post cut to about, depending on where you were in the forest, year nine or year 12, um, where it was suitable for jays. What they've done now is they've taken a, a, a large acreage out of timber management and they put it into what they were calling ecosystem management. And it's, it's, they're targeting for scrub jays as their kind of uh, umbrella species or their focal species. Um, and we're, they're gonna slowly get to about another 70,000 acres, which will be in scrub jay management, which means we will, it won't be in a harvest situation anymore. So it'll be basically they'll, they'll harvest their sand pine and then they'll mechanically treat it over the years and put fire on it and keep it suitable so it's not a rotation where the jays have to jump around the forest. So we're hoping that um, that landscape really improves and starts holding more jays. We, you know, we estimated that with the forest plant amendment and the timber uh, harvest and different things, we could probably have double the, we could probably have close to 2000 territories in Ocala National Forest alone. Next slide. Okay, now we're back on the West Coast. This is uh, the duet numbers. Um, and and I, for people that don't know, duet preserve is a, is a county preserve, but mosaic well field, that's uh, phosphate. And back in years and years ago, when they wanted to increase their extraction of phosphate, they did a big habitat conservation plan and they, what they did is they basically tried to improve the demography of the birds out there. So they, they basically gathered all the birds up on the landscape and translocated them to mosaic well field. Since then, they've kind of spread out to Duet Preserve, but you, you can see there's a big gain there. That's not all intrinsic growth. That, doesn't mean, that means that, that that's not all that's been generated on the site. That's a lot of the birds that have been reorganized but um, we're doing very well there. Um, one of the recovery team members, Dr. Bouton, uh, Raul is now working with Mosaic. He, he's employed by Mosaic and we're, we have a um, group we're putting together that we're gonna look at viability for that population and what we need to do, where we need to acquire property, how we need to manage, how we need to get everybody in sync to manage in the same fashion so that we can start growing the birds, not only in Duet, but all the, the, the other properties I have listed there, those are all within dispersal range of Duet. And it, it, that goes back to that map that I showed you. Next slide, please. Here's Jonathan Dickens. So you can see Jonathan Dickens is, is starting to improve. Marion's numbers for 2020 were very good. I haven't seen those numbers. So 
that's even better. So hopefully some of these translocations and the results of the habitat management, you know, a lot of times it takes a couple of years for things to kick in and for birds to respond. So hopefully, uh, I think Marion's numbers were so, somewhere around 29 territories now for Jonathan Dickinson, which is, which is great. We, we, if you go back to those maps, you can look at a number that's within that focal landscape and it'll give an estimated carrying capacity based on a, a little formula we came up with. And uh, it's anywhere between 80 territories to 100 territories. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now we're, we're, we're jumping to a, a whole different thing. And I'll try to really make this basic and I'm only giving preliminary results. But what we're looking at is that we're developing some models and, it, and it, as you can see, it's uh, Bob Lacey and Dave Brenninger are the, are the main actors. They're the ones that are doing most of the modeling, but we've reached out to everybody. Archibald Group is involved. Um, Avon Park is involved. We've, 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 been, we've brought in everybody. And so what we're doing is we're looking at data sets. And so what we're looking to do is try to find out what is a viable population. So what is a population that will survive for 50 to 100 years? And so you can kind of see if you read through that, I don't want to read through everything for you all, but I put this up and then you'll have access to this. But that's basically what the, some of the questions we hope to answer when we finish this PVA. So it has to do not only with population viability, but we can give management recommendations and options and targets for population. So we're, we're doing this initial PVA on Merritt Island, and then we're, we'll do Cape Canaveral. And then we're also doing, um, we're using Dr. Brenninger's data on mainland Brevard. So all those small populations and we're looking at viability. So the, the whole point was we wanted to look at a large landscape like Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, which is actually NASA property that the refuge just manages and Cape Canaveral, which is owned by the Air Force. Those are between the two, I think there's over 20 some thousand acres of scrub. And so there's, there is fragmentation in, amongst the landscape, but it's not as dramatic as when you go on the mainland and the mainland is very fragmented and very small. So we're, we're actually running models on both those and I'll touch on them a little bit in the next, in this presentation. Next slide, please. So here's basically, this is what the, we hope the PVA will tell us. Um, and so we're trying to project out and what we plug into the model are different habitat states that will help us figure out viability. It's a very, very complex model. Um, we look at recruitment, we look at source sink, metapopulation dynamics, um, we look at uh, proportions of habitat that come and go, uh, short-term, long-term viability. Um, and then, you know, you, I'm not a big modeler, but you know, with all models, you can manipulate things. So you can put in, you can weight it, weight different uh, variables differently and see how that'll work. Um, bring, bring variables in, take variables out. So it, 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 this is kind of a little complex for the groups. I didn't want to get too much into the weeds. We can always discuss it. And then once the model is developed, which should be within the next year, it'll be in 2021. Um, we'll have that out there and there'll be a big explanation of what they did, how they did it and what the results were. So I'm just going to give you a couple preliminary um, runs of some models. Next slide. Oh, okay, I, I touch more on what is minimum viability, which depending on the species you're working on, you know, a manatee that has a very long uh, lifespan reproduces differently versus a, you know, our bird, our birds are, you know, a generation for a scrub jay is what, five to seven years, maybe. Um, so these are different parameters we looked at. Next slide. 
to 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 just to define our terms. So what we did is we or what they did is they actually looked at different different numbers to plug in. So when you see that it says five to, to 25 to 400. So if you if you look at the very, very bottom blue line, that's a population of 20 to 25. And that's that's what's going to happen over time per this model. Then you get up to the 400. And you know you can see that that's going to well it actually started at 280 and it increased to 400. So these are projections. These are basically the runs with all the variables in it of how many breeding pairs there are, what kind of recruitment, how much habitat availability you have, what's your habitat state. And so basically what this graph is telling a modeler or a scientist is you basically need about 100 territories to sustain long-term viability for a population. What, and, and just to remind you, we did our mapping exercise based on the 91 uh, simulations that were based on 40 territories. So it's, it's quite a bit different. You know, we, the, the metric is much, much higher for, for viability, we think. Next slide. Can I just, just insert one thing? So if you all aren't tracking this really well, Todd's using the term number of territories that translate that in your mind to number of family groups. Family groups. Or right. breeding pairs. Breeding pairs or uh, pairs with a uh, pair with helpers. So territories equals family groups. Right. Because you you it depends, you know, different people record they count differently. So you can have a territory that's one bird. You can have a bird that's defending a territory, but it's not a breeding pair. So what we're talking about here is a territory is a breeding pair. It has the potential to reproduce. Thank, thank you, Mary, and that's a good point. Sometimes I, I skip over some of this stuff. So what we were looking at in this slide is genetic diversity. So I mentioned earlier, Jonathan Dickinson, you know, we don't know if that's bottlenecked. It got too small and we have genetic problems in there. If, if, if everything is too, all the individuals are too related. And so what the, the genetic diversity suggests is you need about 75 to about 100 territories to keep inbreeding low over a 50 year time frame. Next slide. We also looked at different scenarios. This one is basically, okay, you have one population of 100 versus four populations of 25. And so, I mean, unless you're a modeler, it's kind of, you, you just see lines going everywhere. So, um, there is potential vi long-term viability in a metapopulation concept with four smaller populations, but you need a lot of dispersal to be effective. You need these birds to be moving around. You can't just, they can't be stagnant and just have periodic dispersal where one member goes and gets with the resident of the subpopulation. So a metapopulation concept is, and that's described all in the, in the species status assessment of what we mean by a metapopulation, but a metapopulation is basically a collection of subpopulations that interact at, at different levels. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's basically what I, I kind of told you about. So when you start thinking about long-term viability or what the services the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is interested in is, we need large populations on large landscapes if we want a stable population. So right there, that first bullet, 75 potential territories and optimal habitat. So as, you, as you, a lot of you know, you'll go out on these properties, these conservation properties, and some will be just burned and it'll be very, very short. Some will be very, very overgrown. And then you'll have that middle range, you know, where in all the literature it says, you know, less than two meters and six feet and you can see and the birds can see and openings, you know, you have, you have gaps, you have caching areas, things like that. So basically what preliminary conclusions are is we need at least 75 potential territories in optimal habitat. So that doesn't mean 75 territories on a landscape. That means that are in optimal habitat that are, 
where the birds, the group sizes and the recruitment is highest. Um, there's a little caveat that, you know, it's probably closer to a hundred given uncertainties and uh, different events. You know, we, we all, we have periodic disease events that go through populations. It seems like they go through about every 10 years. Um, the next bullet talks about smaller populations. They start to decline because of the, not just because they're inbred, but because they, the numbers, um, occasional immigration can offset inbreeding. And so that's why we're looking at this model to see where and when we need to do translocations. And then connecting small populations can create viability um, if we can have stepping stones and if we can get the landscape, if we can reduce fragmentation, which increases connectivity, which improves dispersal. You know, so if we have permeable landscapes, we have landscapes that birds can get through and find their other, other, other territories and interact with them, that's a good thing. So the, the bottom of that last sentence is key interconnected strong habitat. So we need good habitat within reach of other habitat, basically. I, there might, I think there's another slide. Here we go. It, I've kind of touched on some of this high accessibility. Um, helpers do what we tell them to do that's written down in the literature, basically, a transition to breeders. That's a big problem. You know, we have juveniles in populations and a lot of them never become breeders or never successful breeders. Um, we have the, we know all about dispersal and typical dispersal. Uh, <clears throat> and so what our strategy is in this focal landscape is all about connectivity. And that's why, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why we did the mapping exercise. I believe that's the last slide. Okay, so um, I'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but you can always email me and I can give you, I can provide you documents or more explanation in a different situation. And my email is just my name, Todd underscore Mecklenburg at fws.gov. Back Great. to you, Marion. Well, thank, thank you, you guys. So um, I'm going to start asking the questions. The first one, given the latest analysis by all the state experts, what do you think is the overall future for Florida scrub jays? So just doing kind of a summary of your presentation in one question. Well, I mean, they're declining, but we have several areas where they're improving. So um, we're hoping if we focus our efforts, and we prioritize and we get people to work together and we we don't look at isolated populations but we look at a series of populations of how to manage a landscape and 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 get the landscape back to more suitability for these for higher family groups and recruitment we you know it we're we did in this five-year review. We didn't we didn't take it to endangered. It's a threatened species right now. So I mean, long-term projections. If habitat loss and habitat degradation and disease and and the different things that are in our five-factor analysis continue, um, it will go toward endangered. But we feel that um, hopefully we can level it off and start improving things, which we have done in several areas. And and this this new approach is to focus our efforts so we're not all over the place you know if if we're doing if we're putting all our efforts in cedar key and we let everything else go away then we're we're actually doing more harm to the species because cedar key there's no there's very few birds out there now and even if you know if we want to store to historic range um we're not really focusing where we should be really focused and so our whole thought on the strategy is to try to make these populations as resilient and as robust as possible. And then, you know, down the road, as habitat management improves, 
and future acquisitions helps with connectivity, we can, we'll have a source population to translocate birds. Um, Dr. Miller, is, uh, Carl up in Gainesville, he is studying um, the effects of translocations on not only the recipient site, but on the source. So we were looking at if we're preening birds out of a population, is that causing a negative effect or is that okay? And is there a threshold of a population size where we should be get, translocating birds from? Um, so Kathy, we'll send an email out with the with the links because it, it's hard for me to bring them into the chat uh, also. So we'll, oh no, Marianne has got it because she's amazing. Okay. Um, the official direction seems to focus on preserves as urbanized habitat is too fragmented. Jennifer is wondering if optimization of fragmented urban habitats will allow better dispersal, almost like a contiguous corridor of small plots. The reason we focus on conservation lands on public lands is those are the lands that can be managed. Those are the lands that we have access to. Those are the lands that will, that should have the least amount of development pressure. Um, private lands, you know, we, we, we would love to work with private landowners and do um, partner agreements and have conservation easements, which we do, um, but you know, we can't compete with development. So if if we try to work with a landowner and we try to buy their property and give them a conservation easement or help them out with management, we're in a totally different ball game than if a developer comes and says, I will give you so much per acre and I have endless amounts of money because I've got money coming in as I develop. You know, we we can't compete with that. We have a very small checkbook. There's very few people with money out there. So we have to focus and basically the, the smartest area to focus on is what's in public ownership now that has a management plan that has potential funding or we can augment that funding. Um, Jackie and Marianne can take this too, but um, for all of you, have you found any um, allies in the developer world that, that want to help or is it mostly just private landowners but not developers? A developer's bottom line is his profit. So they will set aside what they have to do to get their permits in conservation or to offset for conservation measures or mitigation, depending on what program they go through to get their permits. Um, we are working a lot in South Florida around say Avon Park and south of there. Um, we're actually pairing up with the Air Force um, and, it's, and we're, it, they have a Sentinel landscape program where they're trying to protect their bases. So they're trying to do more buffers around their bases so they continue, can continue their missions. They don't want all the urbanization to encroach on them. Think about, um, if, if you don't know many Air Force bases, there's one in, in Tampa, McDill Air Force Base. It's on a peninsula and it's surrounded by development versus Avon Park, which is kind of, currently it's, it's very rural. And so what they're doing is they're giving incentives to landowners to keep their landscape open and not, and not develop, not create buildings, not, not do different things so they can keep their mission going with their, their, uh, their bombing and their flights and their training exercise like that. And so we're trying to piggyback or work with them to accomplish our mission to keep it wild, to keep the, the, the landscape native, you know, in, in vegetation. So, um, is that it? Is, is that kind of what you're getting at? I think another thing that's happening is that there are ranchers, you know, people that own private large tracts of land and they don't really want to sell to developers, you know, more in that central area around around Avon Park area in Highlands County in there, um, and they're willing to go for conservation easements. That's absolutely right. 
So yeah. the land doesn't get developed. So some of those ranchers um, really have, you know, they, they want to keep their land in development, but they need some compensation, you know, like for their families. Kind yeah, of. there's a wonderful family we work with, uh, Raptor T, which is uh, Jimmy Wall's property. He's got about 5,000 acres. Um, it's all in conservation. He runs cattle, he does some different things. He works with us. We're trying to give them more money to manage their scrub. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of activities that are very compatible with permeability for scrub jays. So you have a patch of scrub on a landscape and then you have pasture between it. That's not a hindrance for scrub jays. And they're concentrated on the pastures and they don't really do much with the scrub because, you know, you, you don't have good forage and that's not a good area to have your cattle anyway. So we're, we're, we are working with those individuals. And what we found too, is when we get into a third or fourth or fifth generation family, they have more attachment to the land and they, they want their legacy to be that they're preserving old Florida. And a lot of them have, have made money in different industries and different activities. And so they don't have to develop their property. So there are opportunities out there. It's just, it's more common in South Florida where there's larger landscapes. We, we're trying to do this in Lake County. We've tried it in Volusia County um, and Marion County, but the development pressure, you know, when you get near a major interstate or if you get in a county that is very expensive or, and they really don't want to take land out of their tax base, it's very difficult to compete at their level because the developer can offer them a, a lot. One thing we've been able to do is develop mitigation banks where they can sell their credits to other developers and they can make a lot of money. And once they sell a credit, then it becomes, the, the, land, the property has to stay in conservation. So we're getting a lot of, um, scrub jay banking is not that popular anymore. There's a lot of credits out there that aren't being bought. But sand skinks um, are the latest wave where people need sand skink credits. And so we're developing, well, we're working with environmental consulting groups and developers um, to certify and approve a lot of sand skink banks. And, you know, where you have sand skinks, you can have scrub jays, you know, well-drained soils. So these mitigation banks are another avenue that we're, we're um, really working on to get more land and conservation in perpetuity. Okay, great. We have time for one more question. Um, how can we encourage counties to maintain their scrub jay habitat on public lands? That is the million dollar question. If I had a crystal ball, I would tell everybody the, the key answer to that, but it just comes down to each county government. We have county commissioners that are put there by the people and it, there just has to be a willingness to set aside property or fund an environmental program. For instance, Brevard County, they're coming up on a referendum to see if they're gonna keep their eels program going. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's the will of the county. Um, it just, they have to balance all the, uh, the needs of the citizens. Do they want fire and police? in schools or do they want to fund green spaces? We're always jumping up and down at the meeting saying we need more green spaces. We need more land in native landscape. It's good for people to enjoy. It's good for uh, go out and bird. Even if, even if we don't have scrub jays there, it's a place where people can relax and go out and look for butterflies or look for other birds or it's an area that we can keep common species common. So it's, it's just the will of the people. We were hoping that, um, you know, that amendment one that went through that, the, that our state administration would start spending more on conservation lands because the citizens, I think it was like 75% voted that they wanted more land. They wanted to keep that going. So it, it, it just depends on the will of the people and how much uh, they get out and express their opinion whether they vote on these issues, whether they encourage their county commissioners to bring it up in county mm -hmm. commission meetings. Um, you know, so 
it takes everybody. You don't have to be an agency to get out there and uh, encourage that message. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Marianne and Jackie, if you have any final words for Todd, I'll give you um, a few seconds while I'm pulling up uh, some final slides. I just want to say thank you, Todd. You're very welcome, Marianne. Um, this is being recorded, so uh, you can go uh, through the slides again and stop them to look at the graphs a little more in depth um, if that went by you too fast. Uh, I plan to do that as well. So um, I, I think uh, we're ready for our closing slides. Jackie? Sure. Well, let's give Todd a hand. Remember that little thing that reaction? Yeah. Thank you, Todd. That was great. I know that conversation probably could have gone on for a long time. Yeah, so, if people have, if people want to get down to the weeds, send me an email. I can respond. It, it, you know, I'm talking to a very general audience here. Um, so, you know, if mm -hmm. I'm talking to a scientist versus I'm talking to somebody who just wants to know where to find birds or, or what opportunities or, or what programs are on, I, I can always respond in an email to that. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Todd. That was great. Um, okay, so we talked about a lot of the comments that came through. Um, I saw people saying, why don't we have a license plate? Why don't people, why aren't people more engaged? And that is kind of a, a perfect segue into some really exciting news. And that is that we are going to have a new education piece. Um, and education is really the key. Everywhere you go, uh, there are people that do not know anything about the Florida scrub jay. So Marianne and I, Marianne and I came up with this idea. Um, the Audubon Adventures has been around for about 40 years. Um, it's very, very popular in classrooms. Uh, it is produced by National Audubon, and it is a uh, it's directed towards third to fifth graders, but most of the information that you will find there is also very, very relevant for adults. Uh, and each kit includes a foldout, uh, a teacher's guide, uh, little newspapers that the students get to keep, uh, as well as all kinds of interactive um, components online. Guys, thank you so much. Love you. See you soon. Great to see everybody. Take care. Thank Happy you.